Hey, and there's no leg, eh? It's pr- I just realized that. We're there's not no leg. We're oh, not lagging. lagging. <laughs> yeah, leg. There's no legs. Like, I thought we were still talking about the coop glass. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm like, there's totally a leg. A leg. <laughs> but yeah yeah no lag that's awesome welcome back to the modern lady podcast you're listening to episode 131 hi i'm michelle and i'm Lindsay. and today we are continuing our exploration of the discernment process When trying to learn a new skill, having a good step-by-step guide can make all the difference. Learning the skill and art of good decision-making through the virtue of discernment is a great example. So we continue this week with part two in our series on discernment with St. Ignatius and his 11 steps for discernment, and dig deeper into the details on how to actually go about making a good decision rooted in wisdom and truth. But first, the best way that you can support the Modern Lady Podcast is by giving us a rating and review on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. Your reviews, especially on iTunes, can really help others who might be interested find our podcast too. Your comments mean the world to us. This week's shout out goes to listener and friend of the podcast, Athena Weston Davies, who sent Lindsay a message on Instagram saying, quote, I've been away from Instagram, but I've been listening to your podcast and I just love you guys. I want to let you know that your podcast matters here, now, and for eternity. You are both making an eternal impact with what you do here, end quote. Well, wow. Thank you so much, Athena, for your note of encouragement. We were both blown away and so appreciative to hear your kind words and for your support over the years of our work in the podcast. We are so grateful for your friendship and for your company here in the Modern Lady community. And if you would like to leave us a comment, you can do so on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com, or you can leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. But before we get into today's chat, Lindsay has our Modern Lady Tip of the Week. Last week, we learned how to properly open a bottle of champagne and how to pour it. Today, we will continue our deep dive into champagne etiquette. One of the things I learned in my research is that champagne should not be ice cold. I'm returning to the interview with wine expert Catherine Coker on the website foodandwine.com. Coker said that she doesn't place champagne right into an ice bucket. Rather, she likes to open the champagne and then she lets it come to cellar temperature, which is around 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And then she puts it into the fridge to chill it back down another 10 degrees. Another wine expert said that he puts the bottle into the fridge the night before serving it and that it should be between 42 and 44 degrees when served. If it is too cold for too long, then it can alter the taste. If you need to store the champagne for a while before putting it in the fridge, it is important to have it laying on its side in a cool, dark place because the cork can dry out and loosen and then the wine will oxidize and the flavor will change. If you've poured champagne before, you might have noticed the large indent at the bottom of the bottle. This indent is called a punt and it isn't just on champagne bottles. Some wine bottles have one too, but it might not be as deep as on a champagne bottle. One of the reasons it's there is to help you hold and pour the bottle. Your thumb can rest in the punt as the rest of your fingers hold the bottom of the bottle. There are a few more interesting reasons for the punt, and I'm getting this information from vinepair.com. Punts catch sediment. If there is any in the wine, it will settle on the bottom around the punt, and it will likely stay there as you pour. It is also believed that bottles with punts are easier to clean in order to be reused. When you shoot water up into it, the water disperses easily around the punt versus a flat bottom. Finally, bottles with punts seem to stand up to the high pressure of champagne better than a flat bottomed bottle. 
Okay, so you're ready to pour the champagne and you reach for champagne flutes, right? The ones you had on your wedding registry and maybe dust off once a year. Champagne flutes are tall and narrow, and I always believed that they were designed this way in order to show off the bubbles, and also so that you don't cup the bottom of the glass like you would a wine glass because you don't want the heat of your hand to heat up the champagne. But it turns out flutes restrict the aroma, and that also can impact the taste experience. Back to the wine expert on foodandwine.com. He said that while flutes do emphasize the pearlage, which is the effervescence, they can actually make the champagne taste more acidic. He recommended a tulip flute. Now that's another type of flute, but it's wider in the middle and it tapers again at the top. Or simply a large wine glass, which he says immediately improves the tasting experience. He goes on to say that flutes are mostly an American thing, that in France, champagne is mostly served in white wine glasses. He also explained that when we drink champagne out of a wine glass, we start appreciating it like a wine and not just something to toast with. Finally, there's one last style of champagne glass that you might have seen before, often in movies set in the 1920s, and that is the coupe glass. It is a flat and wide glass. It's kind of like a rounded, short and flat martini glass. The coupe glass was created at the same time as the flute, both in the early 1700s as different styles of stemware were being created, and both have been equally popular over the centuries, with the coupe glass being really popular from the 1920s through to the 1980s. Apparently, drinking from a coupe bowl provides a fuller taste experience. Now, Michelle, I am craving champagne, so we will (laughs) definitely have to get a bottle to celebrate the ending of this season so that we can share it. (laughs) Yes, I had that exact thought as soon as you launched into this week's tip. I'm like, well, we o- we obviously have to have champagne. We sure and do. I, <laughs> while you were talking about the coupe glasses, I did um, type it into Google so I could see what you're talking about. <laughs> did I describe I, it well or would you describe it any other way? No, I think you did. I think okay. you did. No, it's very good. I did spell it C-O-O-P, coupe glass. <laughs> and so I'm getting a lot of cooperative ads as well. <laughs> But you you had a great coupe glass distinction. Well done. (laughs) Last week, we set ourselves up to have the best disposition possible to making good choices. And as we learned, that first step is a big and important one. But here we are, all properly disposed. And so now, where do we go from here? Now we get to the nitty gritty of the process of discernment. Right, Lindsay? Yeah, and it is nitty gritty. It is a full 11 steps that we will break down for everybody, you know, assuming everybody's already mastered all of the steps in the previous episode. (laughs) We gave you one whole week. Yes. yeah. Surely you're an expert now. (laughs) It is a process for sure. (laughs) Yeah. But um, before we get into all these 11 steps, we were chatting before we started recording today, Lindsay, and Mm -hmm. I do feel like um, (laughs) there is a story that needs to be told and it perfectly demonstrates demonstrates um, how we've mentioned sometimes about our inside joke of prophetic podcast, Mm -hmm. how, you know, sometimes we'll pick a topic um, or you'll get an, an, like an instinct about what we should talk about for Mm -hmm. that week and we'll, we'll record it. But even to us, it seems kind of random. Yeah. And then immediately, almost immediately, sometimes after we finish recording, something will happen or over the course of the week, something will happen where it's like totally relevant or it makes complete sense now. And it could be like an Instagram post or a book that we're reading or something like that, just that relates to that topic. And so we do have a prophetic podcast moment to share with you all in regards to last week's episode. Right, Lindsay? Yes. So I think I said in last week's episode that um, I had never really looked into St. Ignatius of Loyola before. He was a new saint for me and I'd never really felt compelled to look into him, didn't feel close to him. I I certainly have an army of saints I feel close to and he was just not really one of them. Um, He's not part of your inner circle. (laughs) He's not part of my inner (laughs) saint circle. He is now. I love you, St. Ignatius. Okay. Okay. And we've, I think we've talked before about how as Catholics, we joke about saint stalking, about yes. how some will follow you, right? St. Yep. Teresa of Avila, she's still stalking me and I Absolutely. still won't read her book. Um, <laughs> not for any particular reason. I just, I, I haven't gone there yet. But anyway, yeah. so saint stalking, right? Prophetic podcast, mm-hmm. saint stalking. And so um, 
yeah, we had learned finally about his life. I had written that mini bio about him. And then our family went on a, a, a mini holiday over the long weekend this past weekend. And, um, we ended up going to this place in Midland, Ontario called the Martyr's Shrine. And I had been there once as a child, but really didn't know anything about it. And so I didn't know what to expect going into the Martyr's Shrine. Um, but what is particularly interesting, and I think I should say this, is that um, my family, through my my mom's side, is Indigenous from that area, from Midland and the Muskokas. And obviously, we are also um, practicing Catholics. And we were also French Canadian. So that whole combo <laughs> of my family history wow. really came alive in the Midland area at, uh, at St. Maria among the Hurons and at the Martyr Shrine. Um, and the Martyr Shrine does deal, it, it is, is a church to honor the Canadian martyrs, the first Jesuit priests from St. Ignatius's order uh, who came over from France. And it also it pays very, very close attention to the lives lost of the indigenous people of that area as well um, through the smallpox brought over, you know, from the French, mm. through raids from um, warring tribes, but also through some of their conflict with, you know, the religion and that continued on. Um, they're all doing a really good job of trying to move forward with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, all of that to say it's a very emotional place. Um, and so I didn't know what to expect going in there. But let's get back to St. Ignatius of Loyola. So right. I hadn't really learned anything about him until I wrote the little bio last week. And so we go into the church and there's a huge stained glass window with him on it. And I'm like, oh, hey there. I yeah. talk conversationally <laughs> with, yeah. with the saints, right? We're, we're all family. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, you're here. Of course you're here. You founded the Jesuit order. I don't know yeah. why I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> and so as I'm, you know, talking to the stained glass window, like a crazy person, I <laughs> look over. <laughs> Luckily, we were the only people in the church, our family. Um, I look over and there was a sign that said, um, you know, down the stairs to the St. Ignatius um, prayer chapel. And mm. I'm like, well, we have to go there. So I, mm. all six of us traipsed down the stairs and we're in the basement and there was the Eucharist, you know, exposed for adoration. And we sit down and we start praying and I look over and there's a huge statue, <laughs> huge statue of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And their <laughs> eyes are always downturned, right? It's like he's right. looking right at me sitting there and I look up and I'm like, oh, it's you again. <laughs> I love Here it. I am. Yeah. We're friends now. <laughs> and so I took this opportunity to really ask for his intercession for this discernment yeah. process that you and I are engaging in right now that we'll talk more about at the end. Um, but, you know, I just I thanked him for this inspiration for this episode, but also for the great work he did 500 years ago that is just as relevant and important today. Yeah. Oh my goodness. What a great story. Like, what? <laughs> and you thanked him for stalking you all yes. the way to Midland. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I just loved it. And when, when you said that, I was like, well, this is, you know, those times in your life when so many different areas and factors start to converge yes. into yes. one moment. Right. And I think when you're telling me that story, um, between that and our podcast episodes these past two weeks and moving into the summer and everything we talked about last week, it just, it feels right. It yeah, feels it does. Right. We're yeah. feeling the consolation that we will talk about later in this episode. Yeah. Uh, right. It does feel right. And there is such peace in that. And yeah. So let's uh, encourage okay. others to do. And let's be honest too, Michelle. We actually haven't done this whole process ourselves. I was we, just going to say we're getting yeah. the consolations without doing the first seven steps. Know, it's amazing. God is so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we are going to use an 11-step discernment process, um, which follows the Ignatian method. Uh, we found it on the website called IgnatianSpirituality.com, which is run by Loyola Press. Now, the website that we used for last week's episode, the part one of discernment, was the Marquette University website. Now, they also shared St. Ignatius' discernment technique, but it's only seven steps. So you and I just found that we prefer the breakdown over the 11 steps. So again, we're basing this episode on the information we found on the Loyola Loyola Press website, ignatianspirituality.com. And this article was written by Jim Manny. Okay. All right. So, I mean, we've talked around this long enough. I think it's just <laughs> time to start to dig right in and start at step one. Okay. So step one is identify the decision to be made or the issue to be resolved. 
Now, the website we used gave some great tips about this first step. They said that the issue needs to be practical and real. We might just quickly gloss over those two things, but they are important. Practical? Well, ask yourself, are there actually two paths or maybe more? Because if there's not, (laughs) if there's like Mm. clearly one path, then it's not really practical. Um, Is the issue clear? It might be about whether we should do something or not do something, but those need to be actually real options. Sometimes we think we're at a crossroads, but we actually aren't. Like Mm. we think we have all of these options, but we really don't. Our hands are kind of tied sometimes. So we need to understand this before we go further. What is the decision that needs to be made and what are the options? Then you need to ask yourself if you have the right to make a decision in the circumstance. Who else might have a say? Who would your decision impact? You need to be able to obtain and access all of the information necessary in order to make a prudent decision. Now, the website ignatianspirituality.com gives a five-step procedure if you need help identifying the issue. Step one, list the various issues you might be deciding about in the next few weeks or months or even in next year's time. Step two, list the actions you might take about these issues. Step three, make a list of pros and cons for each issue or or possible action. Step four, rank the issues and possible actions in the order of preference as you currently experience them. And step five, use the issue or possible action ranked first as the focus of your discernment. Mm -hmm. This first step, it seems so obvious once you read it. It's Mm -hmm. like, I don't know how to make a decision. And step one is like, well, what is your decision? Yeah, what like, is your I don't problem? Know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I just need to make a decision. But it is good. It's practical because we do like plans. Like yes. we always feel better when we have plans. But it really hard to make a good one when yeah. you don't even know what you're trying to resolve. It's so, true. And I'm one of those yeah. people, like we were saying even before in our imagination episode, that I think I have 100 problems um, yeah. or things, you know, that can, but it's actually usually just one. Maybe two, like they're saying, right? And so if I can actually narrow it down to what the actual problem is, then you can fix it. But yeah, at first I might have thought, well, of course I know what the problem is. No, I don't. I think I know what like multiple problems are. But yeah, this idea of actually narrowing it down first is so critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that really leads into the second step, which is then you want to like formulate the issue into a proposal, like into the form of a proposal what we're trying to do is to whittle the issue down so that it is simply the actual question at Mm. hand. Uh, And I love how the website described it. It says, state it as a positive, concrete choice. So you're kind of like trying to be specific about the details pertaining to the choice, but you really have to stick to the facts. And often we think our emotions or (laughs) how we feel about a decision or our weariness about the choices, all these complicating factors that may arise, that these are the facts, Um, but I don't think they are. So here um, in this method, we want to be specific and only about the facts, the who, what, when, where, those kinds of things. And then uh, what you're to do with those facts is then you put them into the form of a question and you try to state it in a way that you sense that God is calling you at this point. So the website says to state the question in the form of either an this is going to sound like algebra for a second and I'm sorry there's a lot of x's and y's <laughs> but I didn't know how else to say it so follow me here you want to put the question in the form of like deciding between x or non-x choices or choice x versus choice y mm. does that make sense yes it does <laughs> yep Okay, so for example, a, um, an example of an X versus non-X decision may sound like, um, I will take enough courses next term so that I can graduate this coming May. Um, it's not between two different things. It's a discernment right. of how you're going to proceed with this right. um, step. And then an example of an X versus Y decision may sound more like, I will either stay in my current job with company A or... Or I will accept an offer from company B. So in either case, at this second step, we're called to just pare down the decision at hand to simply the facts and then to put it 
in the question in its simplest terms you could say, which is, um, I want to thank teaching my daughter fractions this week for <laughs> reintroducing me to simplest terms. A very ma- mathematical second step here. We have X's, Y's, A, B's, simplest terms, but you get the idea. <laughs> Yes. Stick to the facts. I actually had to go back and write that in my notes um, because that is something I'm terrible at. <laughs> Again, like yeah. I have all of these mitigating Me factors too. and I think I, right. I think I need to explain them all. I think I need, but no, really whittling it down. I love that you actually brought in fa- uh, fractions. I hate math, but that was my favorite yeah. thing to teach my kids was fractions and breaking it down into the simplest form. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, thank you for that. Stick to the facts. I need to write that on my yeah. hand. <laughs> I know. And it's only step two. Mm -hmm, (laughs) We're mm -hmm. like, this is good. This is good stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, step three, pray for openness to God's will and for freedom from prejudgment and addictions. Now, I love this one because it all comes down to detachment. We've talked about detachment a lot. Detachment being that inner freedom that doesn't bind you to a desired outcome and doesn't allow you to be ruled by your emotions. Now, this prayer specifically asks that you not be inclined towards one outcome or another, that you be free enough to be influenced by only one thing. And the website says that one thing is, quote, the thing that will give most glory to God and be expressive of my own deepest self, my authentic self, end quote. Mm. Now, it's really important to be self-aware at this stage. You need to recognize what roadblocks you might be putting up, what your inclinations and tendencies are. And it would be good to speak about this with someone you can trust, especially a spiritual director. Because other people might be much better at seeing what roadblocks you put up Mm. uh, than than we do. Now, what are some of these potential roadblocks or obstacles? Well, here is the list right from the website. Projections, disordered attachments like inferiority complexes, superiority complexes, or glorified self-images, the shoulds um, or oughts. I should do this. I ought to do this. That Mm. tyrannize you. Like that's powerful. That tyrannize you. Perfection. Yeah. (laughs) Perfectionism, (laughs) fears, materialistic greed and possessiveness, past hurts and self-pity, competitiveness that leads to envy, impatience with yourself or others, lust, ingratitude and irreverence, desire for control, power, status, prestige, exclusiveness, and so forth. I mean, (laughs) whoa, that list, right? (laughs) You need to make sure none of those things are blocking your decision-making process. That's huge. That's great deep work to do on yourself. So I can't help but notice though, when I look at that list, it's so contrary to what the world tells us to focus on when we need to make Mm. a decision. Like we're supposed to project our desired results. We're supposed to manifest things, right? We're supposed to lean into the power of positive thinking because we are told that we deserve all the great things that are about to happen to us. And all of that never felt right to me. Um, I'd much rather detach from all of the Mm -hmm. things in that first list, right? So that I'm not enslaved by any of those things, which ultimately don't serve me or anyone else that I love. Now, they go on to list scripture passages that are useful to read at this stage. I won't list them here, but we will post this article in the show notes so that you can see which scripture passages they recommend. Mm -hmm. And then after reading through them, you meditate on which passages stood out to you. Why did it, you know? grab your attention. And then you use that as a jumping off point for your prayerful conversation with God. Where do you need greater detachment? And remember, we detach from these things because they're holding us back from being totally attached to God. Above all, ask for a deepened sense of love when you're having this prayer time, love for God, for the people who could be impacted, and for yourself, not in a secular way, but a true love of self so that whatever decision is made will properly be, be properly ordered in, in self-love and in self-respect. Mm-hmm. Wow. And I really think that the third step could be like a, a really daunting one and an mm-hmm. intimidating one, right? Mm-hmm. Like even just listening to all those <laughs> things that you listed. Um, so where that kind of comes into like this fourth step and where the connection is, is that you mentioned seeking counsel. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. right? And like trying to ask other people what they see, because probably some of the things that um, will provide an obstacle for us is that we do have probably several of those things going on within mm-hmm. ourselves at any given time. We can't see it in ourselves. Um, and so, yeah, asking someone for good counsel is one of the things in the fourth step, which is to gather all the necessary information. Mm -hmm. Uh, Your favorite. (laughs) Yes. So it's funny because I would say this is actually where I usually start the discernment process. Mm. And here I've like skipped three steps. (laughs) I'm just on the step four. I just blow past all the other work and try to gather information right off Mm. the bat, which is okay. But I'm realizing now that like without taking that time of identifying the issues and squaring away any prejudgments or obstacles, um, I'm actually probably gathering way too much information. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. And much of it may be entirely useless. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Kind of like, oh my gosh, in my notes, I didn't intend on this being a math episode, but I did liken <laughs> oh, no, this. Okay, no. <laughs> I did liken this here to doing like a word problem in math class where Mm -hmm. they deliberately include useless information and you have (laughs) to try to pick out the pertinent facts to solve the problems. I hate Mm -hmm. when they do that. Mm -hmm. Um, And here we may often do it ourselves to ourselves in the discernment process. And Michelle too, like we have Mm -hmm. so much more access to information than, you know, St. Ignatius did when he was writing this. Yeah. Yeah. We have like all of this information at our fingertips. And so, yeah, we think we need to gather as much as we can because it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's such a good point (laughs) that the information age Mm -hmm. really uh, muddies up this fourth step. Um, But when it comes to discernment, um, this is the stage where we're trying to find out all the other missing details that are related to that one decision you've whittled down, Mm -hmm. uh, the one that's at hand. So, you know, we've already kind of talked about the simplified asking of who, what, when, where. Um, But in this step, we need to kind of be diligent in filling out the missing pieces so that we can be, um, quote, satisfactorily informed, end quote. And I really loved that term from the website. So one way we're to take this step further than the five W's is that we are to consult with the people who are involved or who will be impacted by this decision. Um, People like your spouse, your children, if they're old enough, um, other family members or friends, colleagues, if it's a work-related decision. And I think that, like we were talking about with counsel, in getting an idea of how they feel about certain aspects surrounding your decision, it will give you a clearer idea of where you should go. And so, um, again, you mentioned speaking to a spiritual director. And one of the pieces of advice from this website is that after you've spoken to those impacted by your decision, the next step is to consult a third party. So someone else who is grounded in the same values that you have. In our case, we'd seek someone with similar Christian values. Uh, And you can present your decision um, or your choices to that trusted friend or counselor. In our case, we do often seek the counsel of a priest. Uh, And I love consulting holy priests, by the way, when we have big decisions to make, because they truly do operate and think with the divine and eternal at heart. And they see big picture. And I so appreciate that. So we're at step five, and I think after hearing all of that, we shouldn't be surprised that step five is repeat step three back to prayer. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Right. We've gone through a lot in these last couple steps. (laughs) I know. I have it written here. It's like a spiritual check yourself before you wreck yourself. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yep. Little check in. So back to prayer. Now, by this point, you've already made great progress, although it might not seem like it. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. The process might seem so slow because we have been conditioned to make snap decisions, decisions on the spot. So this truly is an exercise in patience and trust. And so we pray again, but this time our prayer is a bit more focused as there is new data to consider. It is likely that this new data and our time spent reading those scripture passages have caused an emotional response in us, and perhaps we have slipped back into disordered attachments, again to things like money or fame, you know, making their way into our discernment process, or prejudgments over how we think it should turn out. 
The Ignatian Spirituality website calls this the freedom check. I like yours too, Michelle. <laughs> the check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> Mine's a modern twist. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and I just love this so much, right? The freedom mm-hmm. check. Let's remind ourselves again of the one value that should be foremost in our minds, which is all about which option will give the most glory to God and be expressive of your most authentic self. So back to prayer, always back to prayer. St. Ignatius wrote in his spiritual exercises that we need to pray for the grace to try to be like a balance of equilibrium without leaning to either side. Whew, it's so good. So um, it gives you a little bit of a break there with step mm-hmm. five, because you're supposed to get right back into it at step six. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually where I feel like what most of us would think about when we talk about decision making and discernment. Mm-hmm. This is where it kind of starts to pick up a little bit. Right. Um, so the sixth step is to state all the reasons for and all the reasons against each alternative in the proposal. And I love this step because I think it's best described you could describe it as like a discernment brain dump Mm. Um, and yeah and doing a brain dump sometimes just alleviates so much of the stress and the pressure already getting it out of your head and onto a piece of paper can be therapeutic in and of itself Um, but basically here we're just to make lists you're to make two lists describing all the advantages for you in a decision and a list describing all the disadvantages for you in a decision And if you're trying to decide between multiple options, then you're to make those two lists for each option you're considering. So a pros and a cons list, essentially for every possible outcome you're seriously considering. Before putting pen to paper, again, the website counsels to say a quick prayer, asking God to help us to see clearly all the implicating factors, all of these advantages and disadvantages. And then you can go ahead and put everything down, list it all, all the reasons you can think of. The brain dump aspect comes into play in the sense that at this point, you're not to stop and consider or prejudge any of the reasons that you list Mm. or, you know, how legit they are or how important they are, whether they seem silly to you. Um, You're simply to just write down anything and everything that comes to mind in the form of a pro or a con when it comes to those options. Okay, so number seven is do a formal evaluation of all of the advantages and disadvantages. Now, this is a building on the list that you would have just made Mm -hmm. in step six, but this stage might take weeks if Mm. it is a major life decision. Weeks. (laughs) Again, we got to slow down. Um, This is really the discernment of spirits part. Are you being influenced by the Holy Spirit or not? Where is the Mm -hmm. influence coming from? Pray again for openness and freedom from attachments. Pray for wisdom and ever deepening faith and love for God. Now it's time again to reflect on your motives and values. And this website suggests these questions. Number one, which reasons are the most important and why? Number two, what values are preserved or realized by each option? Many advantages and disadvantages may be pointing to the same value. Number three, which option more evidently leads to God's service and better serves the growth of your true self in the Holy Spirit? And number four, which option seems consistent with your own faith journey and history with God? Now, I'd like to add the question that Jason posed when we were facing a huge decision several years ago. And he said this to me, if you became a canonized saint and someone was reading the story of your life and came to this moment, what is the clear direction that saintly you would have taken? And it's like WWTSD. What would the saints do? Um, that really helped me go, wow. Because when you're reading a bio of any of the saints, it's it, it mm-hmm. just makes so much sense, right? So putting yourself into that. And it's not presumptuous like, that you're going to be right. a canonized saint. But I really did feel like it helped me go very clearly, okay, I know what the saints would have done. St. Lindsay would have done this. Yeah, (laughs) it's true. That is a great, it's a great thought exercise Mm -hmm. to help you keep perspective. I like that. And step eight, as we're coming up to it, builds on this one as well. So I do feel like steps six, seven, and eight, even though they happen over probably a much longer period of time Mm -hmm. than the other steps, they do kind of all go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Uh, And step eight is to observe the direction of your will 
while reflecting on the advantages and disadvantages. So this is what we were talking about, like judging your motivations, right? And being critical of what we're, what our intentions actually are. As we're looking through these pros and cons, our own desires are going to start to be influenced, hopefully by the Holy Spirit, as we're rooted in prayer, in one direction or the other, in favor of one option or the other. So as we go back and forth between our options in this step, um, the Ignatian method encourages us to pay attention to these interior movements and which option we're starting to feel more inclined to. So prayer continues to be the guiding source here. And I think as long as these directions begin to take shape and form, if we keep praying for that light and clarity from the Holy Spirit, eventually our will will settle on one of the choices that are before us. So I feel like this is the best possible outcome of this step is just to like have done all the legwork. And then when push comes to shove, you'll just know Mm -hmm. instantly, right? (laughs) Which choice you're supposed to choose. (laughs) Uh, But St. Ignatius, through this method and through this website, he does caution that like in the previous step, this may take a while too. Mm -hmm. And that it's possible that our will won't settle on any option and it will continue to go back and forth between our choices. Mm. Well, what do we do then? Like we're doing this whole process so we don't get to this point. (laughs) I felt like so the council is once again go back to step three I feel like we just need to print a bumper sticker about that just go back back, to step three back to step three yeah (laughs) and pray again for that interior freedom from the holy spirit because it's likely that there is still some sort of attachment that's influencing you but what I love about this stage is that it really does seem like a partnership at this point. Like mm-hmm. this is where discernment and decision making affirms a loving relationship between mm-hmm. us and the God who loves us and who wants the best for us too. Because it's not superstition, right? right. Like when we're talking right. about discernment, this is not like waiting for the lightning to strike or for yeah. the right choice to mysteriously start glowing or right. something like that. At this step, it really is an invitation from God to use our God-given intellect to seek wow, his yeah. wisdom, right? While also yeah. reasoning our own way through these options. It's like God turning to us at this point, um, both of us having looked over our lists and him saying, mm-hmm. so what do you think? Or Mm -hmm. what do you think you should do? And I just Mm -hmm. really love the intimacy of that kind of relationship that we're called to. Oh, I love that so much. And that leads beautifully into step nine, because if we're, you know, working on our end of the relationship, there is like heavenly reassurance. I've experienced this. You've experienced this. Mm -hmm. And so because it is this intimate relationship with God, truly a relationship, and because he is a father who loves us so much, he can enkindle within us like this, these feelings of consolation. So, so step nine is ask God to give you feelings of consolation about the preferred option. So Mm. I know that these feelings of consolation are real and they can be so clear. So according to the website, ignatianspirituality.com, this is the third of three states of discernment. Now, to be honest, I was like, what? Now we're learning about these three states? We're nine steps in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but okay. So here are the three states. And I'm taking this right from the website. So quote, first, you asked the Holy Spirit to transform your thoughts, listing advantages and disadvantages. Second, you asked the Holy Spirit to transform your desires, your will, while evaluating the lists of advantages and disadvantages. Now you ask the Holy Spirit to stir feelings of spiritual consolation. These are feelings of joy, enthusiasm, deeper faith, greater hope and trust, greater love, confidence, courage. These thoughts, desires, and feelings are all parts of your inner experience of the Holy Spirit guiding you to the truth, end quote. My goodness, I love that so much. It's Mm. consoling just reading it. Um, It goes on to explain that these feelings, this joy, enthusiasm, deeper faith, greater hope and trust, greater love, confidence and courage, these feelings are made so clear within you when you are clearly pointed towards serving and loving God, the goal of any discernment process. These feelings are noticeably different than when you are serving only your own desires and what you are attached to. Unless you've gone through that, it's hard to believe that 
because I think you're right, Michelle. Mm. I think that we can have a tendency to be like, well, this is the formula. And if we tick off all these boxes, there will be a a reciprocal Mm. act from God, right? Like it's not like that. It is a relationship. And I have lived in both worlds, right? I've not made decisions, Mm -hmm. plenty of them without considering God because God wasn't part of my life. And then this way. So I do know that that anxiety, that tension, Mm. that, um, the feeling of just not being peaceful, of feeling fear. You're right. Mm -hmm. Like I felt all of those things. And that is a result of not properly ordering this process and, and second guessing yourself, my goodness. Um, so those are also very real feelings that you will feel, but when you do it this way, you were really promised this sense of deep peace. And yeah, I've definitely experienced that. Now, if you were feeling both consolation and desolation, you still might be improperly attached to things. So back to step three. <laughs> it's like a board game. <laughs> we sh- no, go Michelle straight to three. Do you not pass go. <gasps> oh, we do. We, More merch. We need to add that okay. to the merch shop. Yep. The ignition yeah. board game. <laughs> Process of discernment. <laughs> yes. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Oh back to step three. <laughs> This is amazing. Um, So back to step three and praying again for freedom and openness to God. (laughs) Oh my goodness. It's so good. So once you get out of step three, you get out Mm -hmm. of step three card. Um, (laughs) Step 10 really builds on this relationship aspect of decision making. Because um, again, like I love that it ended in the article talking about like, what if you still have both kinds of feelings? Yeah. Yeah. Um, This is life, right? And not everything is so linear or so cut and dry. And sometimes it's still, even at this stage, um, there's still just some hesitancy. And so step 10 simply says, you know what, at this point, you've, you have to trust in God and you have mm-hmm. to make your decision, even yeah. if you're not certain about it. Um, and I love that in the article, you know, there is actually nothing further under this step. That was just it. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. trust in God, make your decision, even if you're not certain about it. Period. And we actually talked to, yeah, period, literally period. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So we talked about this in last week's episode, right? This connection between decision making and trust in God. And I think that that's what this really boils down to. Mm -hmm. And I do like that this step reminds us that we're to do it, even if we're not certain about it. This was actually one of my favorite sections in the book called Searching for and Maintaining Peace by Father Jacques Mm -hmm. Philippe. And in the book, Father counsels us to do this. And sometimes we do have to just make a decision um, because, and that sometimes even if it is the wrong choice, uh, actually making a decision and then moving forward in our lives with trust in God's providence is more pleasing to God than staying stuck and paralyzed Mm -hmm. in our decisions forever. I think that this shows that childlike faith that we're called to and that when we've done everything that we can possibly do to make a good decision that is rooted in wisdom and free from any other desires or attachments, then, you know, whatever we decide, we can then have faith that God is going to give us the grace to move forward in Mm -hmm. it. And we trust that he'll be with us in that decision. And we trust that he will reroute us if and when need be. And so that in the meantime, we're just going to keep moving forward and we're not going to worry about it anymore. And in his book, Father actually writes out an example of a prayer of this like attitude of confidence and abandonment when we're making decisions. And it says, quote, Lord, I have thought about it and prayed to know your will. I do not see it clearly, but I am not going to trouble myself any further. I'm not going to spend hours racking my brain. I am deciding such and such a thing because all things carefully considered, it seems to me the best thing to do. And I leave everything in your hands. I know well that even if I am mistaken, you will not be displeased with me for I have acted with good intentions. And if I have made a mistake, I know that you are able to draw good from this error. It will be for me a source of humility and I will learn something from it. Uh, End quote. And then he just finishes with, and I remain at peace. Oh, I was like, instead of end oh, quote, we amen. just end prayers with amen. 
<laughs> Michelle, I don't know if you know this, but usually you end <laughs> prayers by saying amen. <laughs> oh my goodness, oh, I had so to laugh good. because I was tearing up. That was so beautiful. Right. Isn't it so good? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the I think like 10 is like the j- so just do it part. Like you could right. get to step nine and not have actually done anything um, yeah. yeah. action wise for your decision making process. Yeah. Well, and the final step is to confirm the decision. Um, This one is also Mm -hmm. short, but they explain that you should, quote, live with your decision for a while in order to see if those feelings of consolation continue. And if not, it's perhaps time to consider if there's any new data to consider. And if so, you start again at step one. (laughs) Now it's all step one this time. Uh (laughs) Now I would suggest here to perhaps asking your spiritual director or your parents or your spouse, um, ask them how you seem to be doing since you've made this decision. Mm. Um, You know, I feel like, again, sometimes they can see it better in us. Um, They can see if we're benefiting from those feelings of consolation. Um, So if you love and trust those people, place value in what they've been observing in you since the decision was made. Mm -hmm. I love this. I love this last step because I think it takes a lot of pressure off in the sense that there's no finality um, to these decisions, which I think is the scary part of making decisions sometimes is it can seem very final. Um, But the, the fact that you constantly are called to confirm the decision and if not, Mm -hmm. you just go back to step one and rediscern it, um, I think is great because it leaves that openness to God's will at play. And, uh, I have a great example of that even in my own life. I still have the notes, and I I did this even before knowing about the Ignatian method of discernment um, from years ago, several years ago, when we were discerning first whether to homeschool Mm. our kids or to enroll them in our local Catholic school. And this was when our oldest was going to enter junior kindergarten when she was four, and she's 10 now. And I still have those notes and I have the pros and cons list for each option. And we discerned at that time that we were going to go to school and they did go to school. And here I am like (laughs) like six (laughs) years later and we are now homeschooling. Like that Mm -hmm. rediscernment had to take place. There was a lot of new information. Let's just say that happened. (laughs) That caused us to come back and revisit it. So all that to say, yeah, the life is so um it's so circular it doesn't happen in the way that we often think of it in terms of a timeline right just straight and with no um bends or circling backs or anything like that and that when we're trying to make decisions we can go through all these steps and just know in our minds that we'll probably have to do this again for other decisions and possibly even for the ones we've just decided on Yes. And I think it must get slightly easier every time as you go through this process. It might become more habitual Mm -hmm. or instinctual. What I love after having done all of this research, um, and then even his prayer that you just read out, um, is that there is such freedom in the process. And I think it's so contrary to what we would think when you look at like two Mm -hmm. hours of us talking about all of these steps, you think, how can there be freedom in something that seems so rigid rigid and structured? Um, But I, after going through all this, um, I, I don't know. I think a lot of people are like this. Um, I feel like I need to know in my own core that I have checked all the boxes that I've done all of the work so that I can go, okay, I did it all. Um, and so if I were able to go through this process, I could crawl into bed every night going, I've done the process, but then the freedom is, is that there is a detachment from the outcome. If I, if I did Mm. all of that and like the prayer says, and things still didn't turn out well, I truly know I did all I could. And if it does turn out well, there's that knowledge. I also did all I could. So there's such freedom in this, what seems like on the surface, a very complicated or maybe regimented process. It's not actually like that at all. Yeah. Those are all such great points. This whole episode is great points. 11, actually. Good points um, <laughs> to consider. <laughs> um, and you know what? we, You and I talked very briefly this morning before we were going to hop on to record, and we get the sense that this is where we're going to break for summer, right? Yeah. Like, it just seems like a really good time with this particular episode uh, specifically to kind of take a break because... We're at a place right now where we want to discern what comes next 
for the podcast and for us in our personal lives. We started this podcast four years ago Mm -hmm. and everything was so different. Like, I don't, I don't think there could have been, we could not have foreseen (laughs) where we would be (laughs) four years later. And it's been amazing to be able to have the podcast community and this outlet for our own creativity through everything else that we've had to adapt to over time. But it is good and it's natural for um, us to take stock of what is the plan here? Like, what are yeah. what are we going to do next as we enter these new phases and stages of our lives, right? Yeah, it, it, this has grown into something we could have never even dreamed of. You know, we've said before that when we started this back in 2018, we were basically speaking to our daughters and our granddaughters. And we we're constantly mm-hmm. in shock and awe of by the response um, and the community that we have here. Um, And so we never expected these download numbers every week. We never expected to be heard around the world. Uh, We see you all who are listening all around the world. And we're just truly honored again, that you've chosen us over and over again to be in your ear as you drive to work, as you wash your dishes, as you rock your babies. Um, And there are great feelings of consolation Mm -hmm. that we get from that, right? Um, We get your messages, we get your kind words, we get your reviews. Views. And those are like external consolations that we get. Um, but you and I are both in this period of our life where we're both like in this um, transitory phase. And for me, you know, I've moved into having two teenagers and two younger kids, and that has hit me in a way that I wasn't prepared for. And so getting their voices heard by older kids is really important to me. You were talking about that, right? If, if your kids are a bit mm-hmm. older, it's important to take in what they're feeling too. And My older kids have been supportive of the podcast, but I know I definitely need a bit of space and distance um, over this break to really be with my teenagers in this new stage that they're at. And you have this great opportunity with homeschooling, Michelle, um, that you're constantly discerning to how long that will continue on. Um, And so to Mm -hmm. just be able to pour all of your energy into that right now is such a gift. Uh, We see now that time is a luxury and a gift more than anything else. Um, So we want to enjoy this break and we don't know how long it's going to be. We really are open to God's will and we both can commit that we're going to be doing this actual discernment process um and see where god's calling us back to um in terms of the podcast and Mm -hmm. so we want to go small we want to go quiet we said this even was it two years ago as we were wrapping up the summer that idea of rest in silence right we always feel feel like towards that (laughs) (laughs) i will say i do feel like um very naturally too Oh, we tend to end on an episode similar to this. Yes, we do. Sentiment <laughs> of rest or silence or craving that space and distance. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, I think it's very natural to feel tired. And this year in particular, we're just feeling it a little bit more. So we just plan to give ourselves a bit more of that break and that, yeah, that space. Yeah. So we're asking for you to pray for us as we enter into this discernment process about what the podcast um, future looks like for us. We have loved every second of it, but we always want to make sure that our end goal of knowing, loving, and serving God is primary for us. Mm -hmm. We're big believers in practicing what we preach. And so we talk all the time about constantly reevaluating your life and making sure Mm -hmm. you are being the best you can in your vocation and in your state of life. Um, And so we want to make sure that we are giving um, our best selves to our husbands and children. And so maybe that just requires a couple months break, right? To refocus on that and come back refreshed. Mm -hmm. We don't know. So we need your prayers. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I was just going to say all of this to say, we don't know. (laughs) We don't know. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Because usually when we sign off, I think like for all of this winding down, um, what we're trying to talk our way around right now is (laughs) that usually, usually when we sign off, we say something certain, like we'll see you in September (laughs) or um, we'll be popping in throughout the summer or stay tuned for this special thing we're doing on the side. Um, But this year we just, we don't have any of those future plans. And we've decided instead of worrying about coming up with a game plan to already come back as we're winding down, we're just going to let ourselves um, take a breath for a second. And so entrusting ourselves to God, you never know 
what he's going to do <laughs> when you give yeah. him control like this. And so we do ask for your prayers because you are very dear friends of ours through this mm-hmm. podcast and you have been the support and the encouragement and the delight of this whole process. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, your prayers and your encouragement and your, um, yeah, it just means a lot to us now and into the future. We also just wanted to mention and give a massive shout out to our Patreon supporters. Um, Patreon was something very new to us. We still (laughs) don't know about it 100%. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and yet you, you really were just so supportive of us and that we hope to check in over on Patreon actually before we do break for the summer and to wrap things up with you guys over there too. But just, we just wanted to give a quick shout out and mention to all of you who have believed in us and supported us and even financially have been able to support us a little bit in the managing of the podcast. Okay, it's time for our What We're Loving This Week segment of the show. So Lindsay, what have you been loving this week? Okay, so I've been waiting to share this. I thought I would have it finished before we wrapped up for the summer, but it's not the case. So I think it's clear to say, though, that I have been loving Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Now, it was first published in 1862, and it is on pretty much every single list that I have come across of the best novels of all time. And I can see why the breadth and scope of this novel is unlike anything I've read before. And you know, Michelle, I just read War and Peace. Mm. So I know a thing or two about epic novels. Um, (laughs) But this one, (laughs) Moby Dick. Um, But this (laughs) one... (laughs) Um, take, it goes so deeply into the hearts and minds and consciences of the characters with each storyline being just as compelling as the next one. Um, I have three different editions of this book and the two on my Kindle have some translation issues, but even with that, it has some of those beautiful writing that I've ever read. Um, I'm sure most people have heard Mm. the music from the famous Broadway show or have seen the recent film adaptation, but I want to encourage everyone to actually read the novel. Yes, it's one of the Mm. longest novels ever written in English. It's taken me months and months, but I only read it for about 20 minutes a day, Um, but it is a page turner and I still actually look forward to crawling into bed and reading it every night. So if you are wanting to take on the most epic challenge, I highly recommend reading Les Miserables. Oh my goodness. Now there's a summer challenge for you. (laughs) Yes, there you go. (laughs) What have you been loving this week, Michelle? Well, actually, like you, I find myself in a season of being in the middle of many things, Mm. (laughs) right? In the middle of books or TV shows. uh, There isn't anything that I've finished in its entirety Mm -hmm. that I can recommend right now, but... Um, The things that I am in the middle of, I am enjoying. So I'm going to recommend one of these things. And I've been listening to the audiobook version of Alias Grace, Mm -hmm. which is a novel written by Margaret Atwood. And it's based on a true story. And I am about halfway through. So the synopsis on Amazon says that the book takes place in, quote, 1843. And Grace Marks has been convicted for her involvement in the vicious murders of her employer and his housekeeper and mistress. Some believe Grace is innocent. Others think her evil or insane. Now serving a life sentence, Grace claims to have no memory of the murders. And an up-and-coming expert in the burgeoning field of mental illness is engaged by a group of reformers and spiritual advisors who seek a pardon for Grace. He listens to her story while bringing her closer and closer to the day she cannot remember. And then the synopsis ends with, what will he find in attempting to unlock her memories? End quote. And so uh, this is actually where I am in the book, uh, right smack dab in the middle of her uh, Grace Marks recounting her days in a fictionalized narration um, in the days before the crime was committed. And so one of the things I'm really loving about this book is the setting because it takes place in our province, right, Lindsay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, this whole um, 
this whole thing takes place in Toronto. And so it is interesting to hear real people and real places that are, you know, localish to us and what was happening here in the field of medicine and psychology, as well as uh, criminology and the legal system historically at that time. And I also just really love how Margaret Atwood writes. She is a really phenomenal writer. Uh, She does tend to be a little bit dark, I just wanted to Mm. say. So it's definitely not a fun or light beachy read (laughs) as we break (laughs) for summer by any means. (laughs) But it is interesting and it's engaging. So, you know, for my part, I'm not familiar with the actual real life story of Grace Marks. And uh, so I don't know how this story, historical version or otherwise, (laughs) ends. But halfway through, I am I am very interested and I'm keen to keep going and finding out. And I will say that um, I believe you were inspired by the new Lucy Worsley podcast, right? That we will yes. just give an extra shout out. We are huge fans of Lucy Worsley. She has a new podcast called Lady Killers. Um, right now, you can only hear all of the episodes if you pay for a subscription to the BBC um, podcast. They are releasing them, I believe, one episode at a time on Spotify. So mm-hmm. Lucy Worsley, Lady Killers, they do an episode on Grace Marks. Okay, that's going to do it for us this week and for this season. Now, if you want to get in touch and chat with us about our topic today, you can still find us on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com, or you can leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at The Modern Lady Podcast. I'm Michelle Sachs, and you can find me on Instagram at mmsachs. And I'm Lindsay Murray, and you can find me on Instagram at lindsayhomemaker. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you have a great summer and we hope to see you soon.